Hello, welcome back to the show. Um, it's been quite some time. I've had a number of things going on, and uh, hopefully I'll be putting out more content soon. Um, so I've had this problem of knowledge production rolling around in my head almost forever, and it was really what motivated my engagement with social theory and eventually anarchism in my early teens, and it never went away for me from there. Uh, the reason why is because I absolutely hated public school, and I'm sure I would have hated private school as well. I was a bored kid whose patience was tested more than anything else in school. It was very tedious for me to show my work in math or to read books below my reading level and report on them to follow along with the teacher's science and history lessons that I already digested from reading the textbook days before. So I would draw in class during lectures or try to socialize without really understanding how I was distracting others. This would get me in trouble, and getting in trouble made me hate the teachers and the administration. And eventually I was seeing the principal on a regular basis. Winning arguments with the vice principal or principal was really what became my goal in life. And uh, in trying to reach that goal, I went online and went to used bookstores and looked for anything that critiqued public education, the school system, disciplinarianism, or whatever else I thought was relevant. Uh, of course, you can't stop there because ultimately the vice principal or whoever else is going to make an argument based on the vocational necessity of schooling, or at least the credentials one earns from school, will get you into economics and politics and everything else. So that led me to Marx and Engels, to Chomsky, to Emma Goldman, to whatever else was floating around at the turn of the century. Uh, so it's been a lot of work through, through all of that in order to really just come back to where I began with today's guest, Derek Ford. Derek Ford is one of the founders of the Indianapolis Liberation Center. He is involved with the International Manifesto Group, and he is editor of Liberation School and associate editor of the journal Post Digital Science and Education. What drew my attention to Ford's work was a few pieces he had written on the knowledge economy and pedagogy. While I have been familiar with various radical approaches to pedagogy, pedagogy for some time. It's really the topic of knowledge production and knowledge economy that drew me in, uh, because besides people like Foucault and some other post-structuralist stuff, the only thing I'd been able to really find that was getting at the questions I had was a book by a, like an Austrian ec economic school guy, Fritz Maklup, or Machlup, I don't know how to pronounce it. And it was called The Production and Distribution of Knowledge in the, in the United States. And that book is from 1962. So without spoiling too much of Derek's commentary, a lot has happened since 1962 when it comes to these things. At minimum, issues of intellectual property, teacher and student strikes, the Occupy movement's origins in campus occupations, and the ongoing focus on student debt uh, and the digital age in general. However, those are indications of something that I think is much deeper and much more enduring, which is a contradiction at the intersection of knowledge production and capital. So to explore that and to shut the fuck up, welcome to the show, Derek. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah. Uh, so what can you tell the audience about yourself that I didn't mention already? Um, well, I don't want to bore them, but um, I, yeah, I saw my labor power to a university as a teacher and um, tried to use that opportunity to support social movements and people's struggles and the prac many of the sort of like activist organizing projects I'm involved with. Um, like the International Manifesto Group um, or Han the Hampton Institute, which I've been a part of for a while, is really are really trying to bring the you know the intellectual the the, the production of revolutionary knowledge 
with from the you know university back to the streets, trying to bridge that gap because that you know revolutionary theory doesn't develop an abstraction. Of course, it comes from movements themselves, and uh, but really you know during the 1990s and the early 2000s, I think from my perspective, you know there was a real radical break, right, in the sort of continuity of a lot of revolutionary theories in, in practice, you know, because of the, you know, you know, uh, overthrow the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc countries and the collapse of the international communist movement, but also, you know, it, it rippled out beyond just like the official CPs um, and then the end of world thesis, all that kind of stuff. So that's, I think, you know, one of my goals. And of course, you know, uh, the many of the books and articles that I've written are like for you know, academic audiences, because I, it's a, like a job requirement. Um, uh, but now i but I've always tried to make them into some popular accessible form, uh, through, you know, podcasts, like, or people would have me on podcasts or, you know, uh, cutting them down and putting them on popular blogs. And then now like my most recent books have been published with Iskra books, which is like, you know, a new radical academic publisher that, is like the best I've ever, or no, not academic publisher, radical publisher. Uh, that's incredible, you know, cause they, their books are affordable and they're also free PDFs online. And so they actually care about the content, <laughs> uh, which is amazing. And like copy edit, it, like, and give you political, you know, like, and like content feedback. Um, and so that's the, the, yeah. So recently I've been trying to like write the book as in, in that kind of form, like, you know, because intellectual, everybody's an intellectual, you know, everybody can understand. It. That's my belief. Right. It doesn't you don't need any, any specialized degree to understand something. And, you know, I mean, that's the whole point. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so uh, to get into this, I want to read a quote from Peter Drucker, which I may have even originally read in one of your texts online and didn't even realize that's where I was uh, grabbing it from. Um, the quote goes, the post-World War II GI Bill of Rights and the enthusiastic response to it on the part of America's veterans signaled the shift to the knowledge society. Uh, future historians may consider it the most important event of the 20th century. Uh, we are clearly in the midst of this transition, indeed, if history is any guide, it will not be completed until 2010 or 2020. But already it has changed the political, economic, and moral landscape of the world. Uh, so what do you think of that periodization um, of this transition that Drucker points out to the shift to a knowledge society? And while you're at it, what, what is a knowledge society or a knowledge economy? Yeah. Well, I'll take the last question first, because, I mean, there's really no such thing as that, right? I mean, there's never been a society without knowledge, and there's never been an economy without knowledge. And, you know, we've always, like, thought and produced knowledge. Um, so, and, and I don't necessarily agree, you know, that we are in, like, a knowledge that that's the best way to define it. Uh, but ultimately, like, one of the reasons I'm interested in it is because whether you like it or not, right, like, it's a uh, you know, it's something that encaps that many people use to refer to our moment, right, in our era. And it, it, you know, the various takes on it do explain a great deal about changes in contemporary, you know, social relations and economic production and, you know, uh, and so forth, right? Um, and I think that the periodization is, like all periodizations, you know, I mean, like, there's something to it and there's something not to it. Um, I think absolutely, like historically in the United States, in the last like 150 years, there's been what as, as educational historian David Labrie calls like an elevator effect, which is basically that, you know, like 100 years ago, you know, no, like very few people went to high school, right? It was like the elite that went to high school. And then the masses fought for access to it and gained access to it. And then there was, they were tracked, right? But then to maintain their advantage, right, then college becomes the elite thing. You know, and then right. the GI Bill, right? The masses are, and, you know, other the civil rights struggle, right? The masses enter the, the university, and then it becomes a PhD, and now there's like postdocs and et cetera, et cetera. So as the top goes up, like the bottom goes up too, right? Is is kind of thesis, and I think that that makes yeah, that make that makes sense. Uh, and 
it was a global phenomenon also, and there are many other factors that I think contributed to it. Um, and those continue to be debated, but really I think it is true. I think that it's not a matter of like knowledge being a factor or not. It's that, you know, not the production of knowledge and then what gets done with that knowledge, right? What, what develops has changed our society and is now central to like GDP growth and the measures of quote unquote, like success of developed and developing countries. So when we talk about knowledge production, what are we actually talking about? Because, you know, in one sense, you may think like, okay, knowledge production is when you write the Bible or something and you have 10,000 scribes copying it every day by hand. And that is, you know, a production process in the in a literal sense. But in another way, you know, there's if you look at like Foucault or some of this like post-structuralist theory, you get uh, like a broader sense of what it means to produce knowledge with this whole knowledge power, power concept, our ideas about ourselves, something more every day. Um, in the in the sense of economy, what exactly is it that we're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I will say first I'll approach it in terms of education, which um, is you know doesn't doesn't really have many educational effects, but it does have social effects, you know, and economic effects. Is that is you know something that Leotard wrote in the Postmodern Condition, which you know I think is like his most widely read or maybe widely cited, but like you know not very carefully read books because. The introduction is like, I'm not making any claims about the future. Like this is written by a philosopher, not an expert. The philosopher, like the expert knows things and the philosopher kind of misses the point. Um, and, but in there he talks about how like knowledge is no longer valued for its use value, but it's exchange value and university is, it's no longer like, you know, um, the teaching, the, the experience of what gets taught, the experience of like transformation or whatever. Um, it's no longer the teacher, it's the administrator and the bureaucrat, right? So the question is no longer like, um, you know, what use is this knowledge for society or whatever, but like, how can it be economically productive, right? Um, and knowledge production, like the capitalists are interested in it because it can be used to, I mean, they're interested in certain kinds of knowledge, right? Knowledge that can be made explicit, right? By which like, there's tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. They dif differentiate between tacit knowledge is like embodied, right? right. Um, hard to communicate, but they want to make that explicit, right? Like in a, in a manual on a handbook. And so there's kind of a spiral between these two things, right? Um, which I think is one of the reasons why you hated education as many as I did too. I was a terrible student, even, even an undergraduate. Um, and the, so really, you know, obviously they're interested in knowledge that likes, you know, saves on labor costs and they can help them invest more machinery and, you know, remain competitive to reduce the socially necessary labor time so they can, you know, beat their competitors and, uh, you know, like thrive on, on according to logic of capital, basically. Um, and then the then that's a value. That's a value of knowledge that like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank attribute. Right. That's why they're concerned with it. Um, and th that's important because that drives like state policies, you know, like those rankings are important. And that then, you know, sort of, tra you know, encapsulate there, absorbs them within this like never ending knowledge production, which we don't ask knowledge for what and for who and on what basis. Right. Um, but rather just like, we, you know. There's no like, it's not like we decide. We've never had a democratic discussion in the United States. Like, what do we want to produce knowledge? What kind of knowledge should we produce? You know, what kind of things should we be thinking about? Like, that, those don't be, debates, have, you know, it's not like we vote on that stuff, right? I mean, it's, so therefore, it's like subjected to the, you know, shifting demands of the global economy, which is, I think, the primary factor for me in this is basically like a transformation from Fordism to post Fordism or from mass production to, um, you know, just in time and individualized production and so forth. So, uh, so what do you, 
So when I have been reading into this, it, it seems like when people are talking about the knowledge society, right, what they're trying to say is like, hey, you know, we're in this post Fordist period and all the things that you hated about Fordism and that, you know, the uh, centralized, you know, bureaucratic machinery of the factory and all of these things are going to go away and capitalism is going to deliver uh us into a new decentralized, you know, Bitcoin fueled, uh, you know, utopia, techno utopia, basically. And it sounds like it gets called information society or knowledge society or, and, you know, all sorts of variety of terms. And um, clearly that, you know, there's that's not what's what the reality of it is. I mean, Drucker was writing that like what in. I don't know, the 90s or something. And then uh, we've had, you know, all sorts of scandal associated with, you know, our uh, current reliance on digital media, you know, um, fake news, this, that and the other. Um, But it is true that at least in like the United States, our manufacturing sector is pretty small or requires a small amount of the workforce, you know, uh, agriculture, super tiny. And we do live in a, in a economy that is basically in one way or the other dealing with knowledge, uh, information, data, et cetera. So there, so there's a commodification of knowledge, right? As you're saying, it becomes, uh, produced for its exchange value. And um, this leads to all kinds of conflict in uh, the introduction to one of your books. uh, I think it it was uh, Marxism, Pedagogy, and the General Intellect. Uh, You highlight, like, you know, all these different conflicts that happen. And... Uh, I talked about it a little bit in the beginning of this episode, and it just seems like on the one hand, these conflicts just are constant. And on the other hand, it seems like radicals, socialists, anarchists, Marxists, whatever, aren't uh, theorizing this to the extent that it should be, uh, you know, in light of how how disruptive all these conflicts are. So I guess, uh, you know, beginning with Karl Marx, you know, and beginning with, and in that book that you're writing, you know, we are, we do see that socialists were dealing with problems of knowledge production. And uh, if you want to give us a little bit of an idea of what Karl Marx was saying uh, about the general intellect, about, pedagogy, uh, and maybe some other figures from that time period and or even in the early 20th century, I think, uh, you know, that would be really enlightening for what we're actually getting at here. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I think to in response to like the opening, I think that that's a good way to frame it. Uh, and, and I believe that, too, that like, you know, I mean, the, the right wing think tanks, they're all over this knowledge, you know, production like they're they're all over it. And the left, I think, isn't right. I mean, we produce knowledge, but it's like, well, OK, you know, I think is knowledge about what again. And, uh, you know, I think it's more about imagination. Right. Rather than knowledge. Like, you know, let's let's envision alternative possibilities for the future, because right now. You know, I ask my students or like younger people, like, what do you think the future is going to be like in 20 years? Do you think it's going to be like radically different or do you think it's gonna be like we're just gonna have more apps and shit and more like passwords you know and two three factor authentication you know and it's always the latter right like you know a little bit different or you know quote unquote better that's whole myth that technology progresses right um and so the but this is where you know michael hart and antonio negri in their book multitude i think have a good way that i i think is helpful for thinking about this that it's not that like knowledge production or immaterial production, the production of relationships and affects and, um, you know, ideas and codes. It's not that it's dominant, like uh, quantitatively, right? I mean, worldwide, 
right? Very few people actually work in the, in this sector. And even within the sector, most people are doing like manual, you know, like manual labor, right? Not the like production of it. Um, but it's hegemonic in the sense that it's qualitatively transformed industrial and agricultural production, right? So they give the example of like the seed, right? What matters now is no longer like how many, you know, apples you grow or whatever, right? But it's rather the, the genetic information contained in the seed. Like that's what they want, right? Um, and that's how Monsanto has gotten profitable, right? They like mm-hmm. um, taking over land, right? I mean, they just plant their patented seeds next to land they want to take over. And there's something called the wind that blows the seeds, you know? And so then the next crop, they're like, no, hey, look, you're stealing our knowledge, you know? And therefore we're going to expropriate you. And it's whatever, that's you know how they've grown. Um, so I think that that is helpful for me in terms of like thinking about the role of knowledge and regardless of like, you know, what, what, what field you're in. Right. Um, and same thing with digital technologies, you know, and there was a euphoria around it. There's, you know, 1999, I think, um, Nick, Nick Dyer with, with referred, I don't know how to say the last name, but he wrote a book called cyber marks and it was like, yeah, internet communism, you know, it's like magical. Um, but he, I read a, a recent book he wrote called inhuman power with two other people. And he like, you know, kind of like, he's like, okay, you know, obviously, obviously wrong. Right. Um, in that, you know, but it makes sense. It was, why not be optimistic? Right. Um, so the Marx had relatively little explicitly to say about pedagogy actually. Um, and throughout the Marxist tradition, education is, and pedagogy have been sort of like, uh, um, but, the. The general intellect is, yeah, it comes from, you know, a, a section of the Grandrosa notebooks that were written like in a frenzy between 1957 and eight of an economic crisis, right? Um, and so they're like, you know, not continuous thoughts, but there's a section that's called the fragments on machines um, in which basically Marx talks about how the, in the future, right, um, that what is the that basically like the knowledge that's incorporated into machinery because that's what machinery is right it's human knowledge that we that like machines don't think or like they can't think right they can like we you know we we create them and like embody certain formulations or you know put put knowledge there you know words and ideas or whatever there but you know machines don't think but what they do is they take the things that we do embodied labor right in in his era he's like the you know the labor of the crafts person right the artisan right and they mechanize that so basically like a machine um and that's why they develop machines right is because as long as it's the 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 knowledge to produce something is embodied in the individual like worker right or producer capital can't control it can't command it right but one, that's why, like, once it's transferred into the machine, the capital owns the machine, right? And so then they can actually, like, that's when dot capital becomes dominant, right? Uh, that's, like, a key moment in, in the development of capitalism, right? Because if, if it was embodied within us, then, like, you can be like, no, I'm only doing this and that and that. But when it's embodied in the machine, the machine tells us what to do, right? And all right. of a sudden like we're no longer working to produce something like the, the machine is working us. Right. So it says we become an appendage of, of the machine in capital. Um, and so that's like, that w- was a central concern for him. Right. Cause you know, that's a central contradiction of capital. It wants our labor power. Right. Cause that's the source of surplus. But labor power is embodied in the laborer. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's the main contradiction. It can't get, our work without getting us to, and we can go on strike and we can, you know, organize and fight back and resist and sabotage equipment. Machines can't do, don't do that. Right. Which is why they prefer machines, but without machine, without labor, there's no value, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so basically he's talking about, he's thinking like, you know, okay, well, if this keeps going on, then, um, it will become so diffuse throughout society that like, the, the, you know, value is no longer determined by like individual or average, you know, socially product, socially necessary labor time or whatever. Um, but rather by like the overall knowledge distributed throughout society. And so some of it, like people take it as like a little bit prophetic, right. Um, 
And he's not saying like, this is definitely going to happen. Right. But he's saying that like the social, like the social brain, the, the general intellect, right. I mean, it does exist, right. We have a, like a general common intellect, w- whether you're right. Um, but especially in the factory, it, it looks like it's uh, the product of capital, right? Because that's how it's presented. Like, you know, the knowledge comes from textbooks from these corporations, right? When actually like, they're written by people, right? But it looks like because capital controls it, right? So it appears to us as a power of capital. So one of the things is like we have to realize like actually like that's our knowledge, right? Um, then sort of like just to help agitate around that. And then it is like, Ultimately, you know, all technologies are like objectified knowledge, right? Um, and so it says that eventually society will kind of become tra- like dominated and transformed by the by the general intellect, right? Um, and there's two contradictory tendencies about this, right? One is like the falling rate of profit, which is the fact that you know, for Marx, you know, uh, value is this labor time, and so therefore, like. Uh, if you have only machines, you don't have value, and there's there's tendencies that you know uh, balance that contradiction out, right? There's a great deal of debates about it, but it was knowledge, right? It's always benefited from it as like a quote unquote free gift, right? Reproductive labor, for example, right? Um, and then the like, so he kind of has this thing where like I forget the quote, but it's like you know the the foundations of capital will explode as a result of this and whatever and you know he's i mean it's you know so it's not there these are a set of notebooks that he never i think intended to publish right yeah they weren't published until like 1939 right. yeah so um but regardless i mean whether he intended to publish them or not marx was never like trying to predict the future you know he just kind of thinking through like well, what if this you know this thing happens right um but i think it's it's helpful thinking about the general intellect and then the ways that the italian marxists in particular started taking it up um and then when it was translated the grunt the grandrista notebooks were translated to english in like the 50s or 60s then you know it became more widespread but they were like oh shit this actually does explain a lot about post-forwardism or the knowledge economy you know um in that like yeah the general intellect is clearly like dominant knowledge you know is 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 very more more central than it was in industrial production so um you know, on the other end, on the end of the socialist movement, the history of you know, revolutionary movements around uh, the world, you do have this other tendency, right? You have the tendency towards radical education, you know, the pedagogy of the oppressed or the Ferrer institutes in Spain and then the modern school and other places. What so do you see a relationship between this recognition of the role of knowledge in the economy and the response to it by the socialist movements and uh, the diff, the the take that socialists had on their own form of knowledge production. So, um, knowledge is uh, you know is important and it is important in like liberatory struggles, you know, anti-colonial struggles and socialist struggles, um, and colonialism is like you know, in many ways, uh, you know, an expropriation of knowledge, right? I mean, it still is, right? In addition to land and, you know, the theft and dispossession of peoples and resources and so on and so forth. And this is where pedagogy comes in for me, where I think about it, um, Eduardo Glissant, a Caribbean philosopher, talks about, uh, it's a it's minor thing in this book called, um, uh Shoot, I'm forgetting the name. Anyways, um, he talks about uh, the grat to grasp, reach out with the hand, and like pull something inward, right? Um, and I thought that that's a, you know that makes sense, right? Like that's how we understand. Like I take this thing that's outside of me and I put it within me, right? And I become sort of you know the owner of it, right? Um, and that seems to me like the colonial pedagog, like that's a pedagogy of colonialism and capitalism. Right. Knowledge is like something out there that we discover and take and incorporate within us rather than something that should be like left alone. Right. And like isn't there for our discovery. And we're not just, you know, like robot vacuum cleaners that are supposed to like suck up everything we find. Right. 
Um, and so therefore, like, you know, the, the, the opacity, where I value opacity, the refusal, you know, like as, as a, as a form of resistance, you know, when like colonized, formerly colonized nations, whatever, regardless of the government, you know, when they refuse to like report their GDP or to like, you know, do all this other stuff or to let tourists in, you know, I see that, you know, as like, I, I think that that's a hundred percent legitimate to respect that. And it's a form of resistance, you know, like, no, we're not going to give it, we're not going to let you take this and expropriate more from us. Right. And sell books and, you know, whatever. Um, and the, and this is actually one of the, like, kind of, I guess, like, the arguments that I make that just from reading all this stuff over the general intellect and you're, because one of the things you said earlier, like, Oh, look, it's like, this is great. You know, like there's no longer this, you know, like factory, you know, it's no longer school, factory, death and church. And your day is no longer, you know, like divided up into these certain things. You can do what you want. Like, you know, we're all free and we can be flexible and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I also found it to be like, well, like thinking about it, like, well, it's clearly also a response to the uh, revolutionary movements occurring during this time, right? In which, like, there's the, uh, there's like the, the, the author, like the valorization where anti-colonial struggles and national knowledge and capital is like, okay, like we can kind of deal with this, you know, um, and we can, you know, maybe exploit it. Right. Um, and so I think that that's, I mean, I don't know if that's like the best way to put it. And this is kind of like a minor thing in the, in the, in the book, but like the, um, I think that like subjugated knowledges, you know, or resistant knowledges, right. They're not disruptive in themselves. Right. Um, like even if they're open source, as you said, right, because they're actually integral to it, you know, because like, I mean, think about at least as far as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, right, but like, li like Mac, right, like, it basically just takes shit from Linux or whatever, like in open source stuff. And it's like, and then it's like, so, okay, now like these ingredients are ours, and right, like makes it as pretty. I mean, what you're saying in general is true. I think Mac comes out of Unix. Okay. Which was already proprietary. Oh, okay. Linux. And Linux is like a pretty much an open source version of a Unix. But in general, software companies, uh, they benefit from open source software. And, you know, there's been all sorts of attempts to, like, come up with different licensing schemes where uh, you grant the right to use the code but only if you don't use it to make any money or you grant the right to use the code but you can't modify it or you know you have different bundles of property rights even within the open source kind of model mm -hmm. and it's actually a big debate between like what's called the free software movement where they argue it shouldn't matter. A company should be able to, or I might be switching this around. One of them argues the company should be able to take the code and use it for profit. The other side argues, no, they ab absolutely should not. And there's been this conflict uh, between, you know, Richard Stallman, who's the leader of the, well, not the leader, but a head figure of the free software movement and, you know, other people who are more on the open source side where it's like, no, let the companies benefit, the world gets better, blah, 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 blah. And it, it kind of falls exactly along the lines you're saying. It's uh, creating opacity or, you know, putting up a, some building resistance into knowledge production, into code production, or um, not doing that. And, like, let's say, like, this happens in anarchist conversations. This happens all the time, like, do we go into the academy or not? Mm -hmm. Do we become, you know, uh, producers of knowledge that ultimately is going to, you know, give the state or whoever else insight into our own movement, insight into, you know, the, the strategies, the analysis and et cetera that we come up with? Or, or do we resist that? Do we try to be more opaque? And it's a really difficult problem. Mm hmm. And what's your take on that? 
if I can ask? Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of, I've been lucky that I never felt the need to personally deal with it because I'm, uh, just such a bad student. I've never been able to even get through like an associate's degree or anything like that. So Hmm. I never had to worry about getting into the academy. Um, but I do write and create things publicly. I mean, even this interview would be, you know, just as much uh, susceptible to like the sort of recuperation, you know, if you take like a situationist kind of angle on it by capital. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know. I don't, I, I, The best example from my own life that I've seen is sort of like the DIY punk movement Mm -hmm. that didn't really say we're going to make ourselves unlegible or like avoid the academy, but it still maintained like this ethic of, you know, doing it yourself or yourselves, plural, that... Uh, was able to reproduce the the uh, the thing that the knowledge was intended to reproduce instead of it, you know, of course, punk also did get recuperated, right? So yeah. it's it's uh it's dialectical, right? I mean yeah. it's a back and forth. Um hey. Yeah, okay. So it is dialectical and historical, like, and nothing, I don't think there's anything that's like, uh, inherently and for all time, irrecuperable, right? Like, or unrecuperable, right? And in fact, there's not, it is dialectical rather than a binary between resistance and recuperation, you know? Like, I mean, you know, like, uh, think about like propaganda or whatever, right? It's a punk band that's like political, all right. I love them. You know, I mean, probably one of the punk bands I like still listen to. I was a, I was in a punk band, you know, I was in a punk when I was like middle and high school called communist daycare. Um, and they, I really liked them, you know, and like, you know, the reason that I had access to them was there was some, you know, like commodification of it. Right. That gave me access to it. Like, that's great. I think, you know? Um, and so I don't know, like, I think that there's, yeah, it is that. And then, you know, I was reading a book, uh, Stefan O'Harney and Fred Moten's recent book called All Incomplete. It's like a, it's like a follow-up, I think, to the undercommons. Um, you know, at the end, they're talking about, like, people come up to us and they ask us these questions about, like, you know, being in the university and, like, being a radical. And he's like, well, I'm just like, shit. Like, did what would General Baker of the, you know, League of Revolutionary Black Workers say about, like, participating in the, like, production of auto corporations in the 19 in late late 90s early 1970s you know like there's no outside of capital or capitalism right. right and so it was like whatever you're doing like you know that's kind of an irrelevant question in a sense right i mean there's the but then of course there's people who like you know produce sexy theories that sound radical and like you know make a name for themselves and get on a lecture tour and you know become rich or whatever with the like you know latest fashionable thing that we all like latch on to immediately because it's more radical than the last thing or whatever. Um, and what I feel like there's less of that now, hope I mean, maybe I'm, I'm optimistic, but I think there's less of that because social movements are rising. Like you said, you know, like, you know, I mean, socialism, right. Anarchism, like these things are no longer like a select few people, like t- a tiny minority are debating amongst themselves. Like, especially with Occupy, Sanders, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, um, the, you know, uprisings against, you know, the war on black America in 2020, just, you know, all these social movements, like people are, it's like back on the agenda, you know, it's acceptable discourse, which is remarkable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did not think I would ever see that happen. I mean, I remember, you know, in like early 2000s, if you try to talk to someone about and even capitalism, even just to say capitalism, that was so far removed from what you could talk about. Class. Now, these were these were terms of a foreign entity, the communists, whatever, that just were not even part of the discourse, let alone socialism or anarchism or anything like that. Yeah. To see that, like, 
you know, these are just like basic uh, questions of growing up now for for uh, younger generations. It's really insane. It's a man. It's I mean, it's unimaginable. Like, cause it's so amazing and inspiring. And that's why that historical knowledge is so important for me. Like, because you know, like I, I didn't realize how long, how the decades of struggle it took to get trans trans like included in lgb you know like lgbt right like i didn't understand it wasn't until like you know the late like the 90s that that happened right even though there were struggles throughout the 70s you know 60s and 70s and and 80s um and the thing about palestine you know i mean i was the student group that i one of the student groups that i supervised at my university had a meeting on Palestine, you know, like when at first, after, just shortly after October 7th of 2023. And there were like 40 people in the room. And the, the university is like 1,600 people. You know, it's not very many. And everybody was like, nobody was like a Zionist there or like a racist, right? They were all like, obviously, you know, people had different opinions about, about it, which is great. You know, it's like, I don't want to hear 40 people say the same thing. That's not a good use of our time. Um, but like, I was like, this is remarkable. Like, do you realize that like, you know, in the early nineties, if we were to have at this meeting, we'd have to have like people with chains and bats outside the door guarding it. Right. Yeah. You know, like, and it was even on the left, it was controversial in 2002 to talk about Palestine. Well, right? I think it, it's funny too, because like, you know, from, from a, if you weren't part of that, time period you know you see the publication date of a book like Rashida Khalid or someone wrote and you're like okay people knew about this at that time the reality is no fucking way did they know about it like people were writing about it yeah but it was not I mean you had to really be a pretty obscure like interested in like very niche things to get at any of that work, especially without Amazon being around or like, you know, like sites where you could download books and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. It, it does warp uh, a bit of a sense of like <laughs> how things have developed, I think for some people, but yeah. And, and so that's important, you know, for that, like to that historical knowledge for, cause thinking about the future, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, like in the belief in revolution, like revolutions are, like they they're not only like possible but they're like actual they've happened right and they will happen you know like uh you know there's that quote i think i thought it was lb Sachs, like a white jewish person who was part of the anc struggle arm struggle who said it but it's you know attributed to many people so but it's like you know before they happen revolutions seem impossible but looking backwards it becomes inevitable it's like obviously that was going to happen right so there'll be a day when we look back on the on the present we're like obviously like capitalism had to be overthrown like that system was bar like barbaric you know like look at what imperialism did to the world like people are going to stand for that you know forever but right now it seems like i'm unimaginable yeah um to get a little a little Back to the topic, though. I mean, so I think one of the consequences of whatever we call this post Fordist time period we're in, you know, this more decentralized thing, even from like uh, Marxist sort of like, you know, uh, a friend of mine just did a video on the essay on authority. And you have angles saying like, look, capitalism is going to continue to centralize things. And, you know, a lot of people, other people writing, they just thought that was just going to keep growing, growing, growing. Everything was going to get more compact and, you know, massified. And that would be the uh, the um, an ongoing process. You weren't going to get decentralization or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you know, part of that. The part that's true is that you did get a big proletarian socialist, you know, international movement that came out of that process. The part that's not true is the part that we're what we're talking about is it didn't last forever. And now we're getting, uh, you know, the atomized, um, fragmented, whatever we want to call this situation we're in, you know, the society of the spectacle. Yeah. And, uh. Um, 
I guess, like, where was I going with that? Well, so what? I don't, yeah, I don't, I lost my train of thought on that, but. It's okay because I can respond. Okay. You have to be, I, there's a question, I think. At least I heard a, a couple of interesting questions. All right. Then, one is that like now we have more access to that historical knowledge and right. And we can like, and people can write about it. So that's like the, you know, sites like library Genesis or Marxist.org or, you know, like, um, what lib lib, uh, what's the anarchist one, like libcom or something. There's the, libcom and then there's the anarchist library. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, theory is a weapon. Um, all those are like great because Jack can go and, you know, do that. And, and additionally like library Genesis, right. Where, all of my books are available on sale um, immediately when I was uh, to publish with these terrible people, but um, not because they're valuable, you know, but just because I want people that be able to read them. And, you know, centralization is also impossible without decentralization because once capital centralizes in one place, there's no profit to be made because it's like, you know, it, the rents go too high, the capital can no longer invest. And so therefore there's decentralization. Right. Mm -hmm. So they like both happen at the same time. So there's decentralization, but at the same time, there's centralization. And like, look at the monopoly uh, academic publishers. Right. Like every I mean, it's amazing. I've only been like in the university for like, I don't know, like, since like between my like graduate studies, like 2012. So like 12 years. And like at like when I would publish a book every time I'd be like, oh, it's like it's with Paul Gray McMillan, but then I open it up and it's like, Oh, it's Springer, you know? <laughs> and then like, there was this whole set of journals that were till you, you know, something and they were sold and now they're sage and, you know, they just keep gobbling and gobbling it up and just publishing whatever the fuck, you know, like they, you know, same cover and everything like that, you know? So there's like the decentralization and they'll, you know, there's more people who are able to write for them and, you know, these small publishers and same thing, you know, with DIY, like, so that's, I guess, the same thing. There's no resistance without recuperation. There's no centralization without decentralization. And automatic, like, it's not the result of any, like, logical development that's predetermined. It's a result of struggle, you know? And who fights for what? And what the balance of forces are, you know? And how we strategize and how we, like, unite and how we form a collective struggle, you know, uh, that can do battle and win. Uh, so I think where I may maybe I was trying to go with that was... Um Okay, so, like, in the past, you had the response of, like, forming, like, uh, the modern school or something like that. Um, or, you know, I, you're probably more familiar with, like, what communists did that I'm not familiar with at all, how they did education when they, you know, were able to take power and things like that. You know, but I feel like, what do we do in a more decentralized circumstance? You know, when we're... I've seen a number of different people, like try to come up with, you know, online universities like this guy Thaddeus Russell does his unregistered underground or, uh, you know, a lot of YouTubers will do reading groups or whatever. And there's something, I mean, what does that do, though? Or, like, does it, uh, or, like, is there a more connected way that matches the sort of subjectivity that people have in this kind of circumstance mm -hmm. and this kind of gets to the, the next thing i was going to ask you but we'll take a break here mm -hmm. to talk about that yeah um yeah i think yeah i mean clearly that was a, like you know that's why post fordism is a response to like the resistance of workers right oh like turns out we get a bunch of people together in factories at the same time in the same place they like talk to each other about the conditions and then they you know win a 10-hour work day and eight-hour work day and they can organize and whatever right and realize that they can do the things themselves without the boss um and then it was like okay good let's like break these people up you know um, and they want individualism. So let's give them individualism and everything is mad, you know, individual, which is like why you can't get, a, you know, like a car part for like eight months is because like every single car is like, in, you know, you can individualize every single thing or whatever. Um, so in that sense, it's like, well, we have to form a collective without like obviously becoming the same. Um, the problem with like YouTube and I think a lot of these things like there's there is that there's like no there has to be a guy there has to be a teacher. That's what I think the teacher's role is. It's to be like, okay, you say, I would say that 
earlier you said you were a bad student. I would say you were a bad learner. Or well, actually, you were a very good learner, right? In that you could, learning is a process of like, you know, not being able to do something and then learning it and being able to do it, right? right. You were good at that. You could do it on your own. You didn't need the teachers. So you would be distracted, right? The distraction is a state of study, you know? So like when you're really studying, you're, you're like, what the, you know, like you start out with one research question and then you're like, all of a sudden, like, how did I, why am I reading this poem from this era? Or like, why am I watching this YouTube video? Or like this obscure thing, right? Because you've like, you know, that's a process of wondering and like not producing knowledge, but actually thinking, you know, it's a difference between you know, those two things. Um, and so for me, I think that's important, but there also has to be a teacher involved to direct us because, you know, education, like education is defined by the teacher in the sense that, you know, we can all learn. Um, and that's what they want us. They want us to be lifelong learners, you know, so we can constantly adapt ourselves to the needs of the market. Right. But, you know, education is different than like other uh, you know, enterprises under capitalism. When I go to the computer store, I'm like, okay, I want a computer that does this, this, and that. And, you know, I want to use it for X, Y, Z, and I can return it if I don't, you know. But when you're in the, when you enter school or at the university, right, or edu when you're in your educational experience, it's almost like the psychologist or the psychiatrist, right? You can't know, like, what to expect, right? You, it's not, it's not a consumer, you know, model, because you might like the whole point of education is like you don't know what you don't know and you need and you might need to know right you might know you might like experience and learn things that you did wish you didn't know you know like i mean i'm sure a lot of i, I know a lot of white people when they learn about racism and white supremacy and it's like you know not a thing of the past right they're like damn i kind of you know like the part of them is like fuck now i gotta deal with this and grapple with it and like you know integrate it right um and, you know, if it was all, it was a, some consumer model, it's like, well, okay, I'm not going to do that. But same thing, you go to a, like, you know, a psychologist because you don't know what's going on, you know, and you, you, they guide you, right? They don't tell you what's going on. They, to my experience, they like, you know, like when I was going to the psychologist or you know, they were like, okay, well, here's a couple of ways you can think about what's happening, what you're experiencing, you know, and they like presented me with these and certain ones, not other ones. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a really the role of the teacher and also the role of the teacher frozen. On my screen. OK, the role of the teacher in an individualized atomized society is to pro to try to produce experiences in which we become de-individualized and distanced from ourselves. Right. Where we feel estranged. And things seem weird. Like what we used to take for granted is like, yeah, why, what, you know, like, why is that a thing? You know, uh, which is why I think philosophy is so important and studying is so important as a counter educational logic to learning, right? Learning is, it's necessary. It's good, but it's also, that's capitalism. The educational logic of capitalism, keep learning, keep, you know, actualizing your potential. Mm -hmm. Studying is just like, just wonder, you know, think, right? Uh, absolutely. And I mean, you definitely like, you know, you brought up the role of the psychologist and you, you actually see the same thing happening in the field of psychology as well, where you get this, uh, you know, you might call it where the analogy to what learning is would be like therapy or maybe a, a new cognitive skill, uh -huh. you know, a new tool or technique to deal with your you know, this or that bad habit or to get your good habits. And you're basically, you know, shopping for a coach to coach you through, you know, this, uh, this learning process. But it's not like when you go to a psychoanalyst and a psychoanalyst is going to tell you all the shit you don't want to hear. And um, it's, uh, you know, you're going to have to deal with the priority of the analyst or the priorities of, you know, in, in education would be the teacher, right? So there's a kind of curating process that, that you know, in all sorts of different fields, even in art, you know, uh, the curator, the museum, you know, whatever, that, that role gets lost when we, when we turn things into consumer demand. Yeah. Um, so this actually it does blend right into what I was going to ask you is uh, in your book, uh, teaching the actuality of revolution, you know, you start, you bring in the aesthetic into, into what you're um, discussing about pedagogy. 
And you mentioned already, you know, something about uh, creating distance and, you know, um, dampening down the, the individual subjectivity. You said something like that a moment ago. Um, and relating that to philosophy and everything else, you know, for me, this makes me immediately think of Merleau-Ponty. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when, you know, in the book you're describing this thing about the cherry tree and how the sensual world is a product of certain modes of production, c- commerce, you know, things like that. And uh, I didn't quite read enough of the book yet to see how you bring aesthetics, you know, bring these two ideas together of pedagogy and aesthetics. But it's clear that that's part of the uh, the equation. Right. Um, So tell me a little bit about that and about like the sense perception and the the. Uh, stuff you would think would be like the purview of phenomenology or like art theory or something like that, but actually you're relating it to politics and uh, education. So I will say I haven't, I don't know much about phenomenology. Um, That's an area that I um, have always been interested in learning about. Like I need to, I, I, I I know it through Sarah Ahmed, queer phenomenology. Um, and, but that's about it. Like, I don't, I've never read who's Searle or anything. Um, I'm a, a bad philosopher in some ways in that, like, you know, a lot of the, these things I just, I'm just like, I don't have time for it. Um, but, um, the, the really, like I would, the re, I was trying not to write a book for a while because during COVID I wrote just, it was like a thing. Like it was my coping mechanism and it became like a problem, you know, I was like writing just all the time until I would like collapse, you know, and then like be wandering around like a zombie and then I wake up and just do it again. Um, but then I kind of, you know, recovered from that and became social again. But then I read this work on aesthetics that finally made me get it because um, my partner's my wife, Sarah, is an artist and I always loved like going like going to museums with her and you know thinking about her art with her because she's so thoughtful about it but you know i always thought it was this thing i couldn't understand you know like because in in high school like you're a good artist if you can like make a tree look like a tree you know like that's a criteria my wife has to deal with that constantly in her school because like you know these kids think they're good at art and then they come in the university and it's like wait that's not art you know that's like that's something else right right Uh, and so reading the work of Gabriel Rockhill and Jennifer Ponce de Leon, it, both of them are writing about, look, there's no such thing as art, right? It's like historically produced. And what gets determined as art is the result of social struggles. You know, the same thing as politics. There's no like inherently thing, like there's no inherent practice of politics that's like transcendent and for all time, you know? Um and so aesthetics refers to that which is sensible, you know, that which we sense in the world. And so the 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 cherry tree example, that's from like Marx and Engels. And this is where I do see a big break between Marx's thought uh, in the like economic manuscripts of 1844 and uh, the German ideology when they broke with Hegel is that, you know, earlier Marx is talking about like we can ascend to a certainty and we can know the world, you know. And then in the German ideology of the writing, no, 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 actually, the entire sensuous world is the product of history, you know, and it, you know, so like, they're talking about Feuerbach, and they're like, you know, Feuerbach, you know, it's so much so like, if he was gone for five years, you know, or something like that, that he wouldn't, like, he wouldn't be able to sense anything about the world around him, right? So it's really how we make sense and how certain things are sensible and not sensible, right? And nonsense and like make sense, not just cognitively, but through like our senses. Right. Um, and then I was like, Oh, okay. I I can get with that. Right. Like, you know, you don't have literary criticism or literature without a like division of labor in which like there's a specialization of writers, you know, and then a specialization of literature critics, you know? Um, and I was like, okay, you know, I can, I can get with that. And it's clearly political and ideology 
it's not a set of false ideas, right? Like, I think Marx is super clear about that personally. Like, that it's like commodity fetishism is like we experience things as they really are. It's not like a it's not like a, a false appearance that we have to get to the real truth behind it, like lift the veil of, you know, mystification. Like he's saying like, no, like I, he says it multiple times. Like it's like we experience things as they really are. Like when I buy something, I experience it as it is, which is like, I'm exchanging, you know, my like money for a, a commodity. Right. I don't know who the producer is or I don't realize all that stuff. Um, and so therefore like capital is actually an aesthetic, I call it a perceptual ecology, right? Like in which it, there's a world in which things make sense and certain things that we sense and can sense and are there for us to see or not see or hear or not hear, right? Um, and we're inaugurated into that, right? Um, through learning, right? Like, you know, look at this, don't look at that, right? I mean, think about elementary school, like basically it's like, don't lick that, you know? Like, don't touch that. You know, don't look, your eyes are up here, not up there. Don't look, don't be distracted. You know, um, a lot of it's like basically forging us, you know, kiss this person, hold hands with this person, not this person. Right. Um, and it's like, what, what, you, what can you touch? What can you not touch? And that's how we, you know, get not just capitalism, but many forms of, you know, domination and oppression. Um, mm -hmm. So therefore, I think that like the, the struggle, right, the class struggle, the struggle for against for liberation for all is has to we have to take aesthetics into account and we have to f forge a world in which, you know, like capitalism is like nonsense, like to people where people are like, what the, f like, that doesn't make any sense. Right. I mean, which it doesn't, but like, you know, it doesn't even work in theory, let alone reality. But like, you know, like we, we can't do that just by telling people things, you know, it's like, it's, you can't do that just by writing it, you know, reading and whatever. Right. Um, so I think that, the, the act of education as in teaching as an aesthetic practice is helping produce experiences in which we sense the world is already so it is already different than what we it what it what we think it is what we sense you know there's already things that are there that we just can't sense and so there's already alternatives that are possible within the present and so for me that's an aesthetic experience an aesthetic encounter like in which I no longer, like, myself as an individual no longer makes any sense. And instead, I'm, like, defamiliarized for myself and, like, wait, you know, yeah, I'm not an individual, right? What the, what am I, you know? I'm not the same as this other person, but I'm not unique in that, in, you know, not, like, separate from them either. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an aesthetic experience, right? It's not just about cognitively thinking about it. It's about actually feeling it, right? Um so, you know, I think that like those who play music or like, you know, have a musical experience with sound, right? Sound is like fleeting. We don't just hear it though, right? We also feel it. We see it. If you're, you know, you can see the ripple weight on, on the waves if a band is playing by the water, you know? So it's like, why do we think it's all about hearing, you know? And deaf people can't hear, which is like not true, right? Because like hearing, like sound is vib vibrations, right? Deaf people hear, right? Just in a different, through a different sense sensory you know organ or whatever um and once that once we think about that it's like oh then when you watch all the movies where like there's a deaf person in it and like there's just pure silence yeah that makes that, that makes no sense it's like that's like obviously just reproducing ableism and this idea that like they're you know people are deprived of sound when they're not at all you know they experience it differently right um and so like playing music, yeah, it's like is a good is a good example for me because sound is fleeting, it's ephemeral. Like we never hear the same sound because it's traveling, you know. Like it's always changed by the time it gets from me to the other person. And when we like when we can kind of construct that differently and think of and like, you know, cognitively, but also like experientially experience that, then that helps us like, I think, you know produce an aesthetic experience in which like the world is already di otherwise and it, we think it is and we experience it, you know? And that the reason why, you know, there's all these anti-homeless ordinances is because they don't want us to see homeless people, you know, or certain people too. Some of us, they want us to see some of them, like, so that we know that that could always be us. Right. right. Um, but like, you know, the tourists, they can't see any of them. The bankers, no, 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 they can't see any of them. Right. But you can have them like some, some places because it's like a threat to us. Um, 
And yeah, I mean, if that, does that answer the question? Like it's the, what we see, what we don't see, what we feel, what we don't feel we can. Yeah, it does. And actually you, I heard you mention something in a video, uh, conference or something you were doing where this just, it, you were talking about, uh, ableism and the role of ability in other prejudices, right? And this is actually something that I hit on myself recently, just in my own writing and thinking about it. Like, um, they're really, it, you can almost reduce a lot of different prejudices to some kind of ableism. And I don't know how much you've developed that because I haven't developed the ideas a lot myself yet. Uh, and I was wondering if you could say more about that or. Yeah. Sure. And this is something that I get from Nirmal Aravalas, um, who is a really, you know, brilliant uh, disability theorist and organizer and teacher. Um, and it, she's like, she says something like, it's the linchpin, you know, of like oppression, because how do you subjugate and like, you know, people, right? Oppre how does oppression function, right? Well, like, they're not smart. They're not right. intelligent, right? Like they're idiots. I mean, all these things, like that's what, you know, their brains are like, that's why like, you know, science, right? The scientists used to study like the brain size or whatever and of, gen, you know, different quote unquote genders or races, you know, and say they're inferior, right? It's always. Or their soul, the soul doesn't have the ability or something like. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's like doesn't have to be biological. Yeah, no. So yeah, yeah, it can be. Yeah, Absolutely. And so, um, so therefore the struggle of the oppressed has to be like, okay, do we then claim and do we then assert ourselves as like, no, no, we are fully, you know, capable according to your standards of humanity and what is, what our ability should be. Right. Or do we fight for something else, you know? Um, and because like that, I mean, that is a, a constant antagonism, but basically like, yeah, the way that we justify oppression, wars, right. These people aren't saying they're you know, terrorists. They don't make any sense. They're just out for murder. They're, you know, like they're, you have to can only lock them in Guantanamo Bay because they just, they're killing machines or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how, that's how that, that's how wars are justified. You know, imperialism is justified. Racism is justified still, you know, gender oppression um, is like when I was an undergrad, you know, Lawrence Summers, the president of like Harvard or Yale, and then he went out to work under Obama he said, he was asked like, why aren't women in style? And he's like, well, their brains don't work that way. You know, like he just said that, like, and it was like not controversial at the time. Right. Um, and there's still like all these people who are like trying to find out like, what is autism? It's like, where is it located? And it's like, well, maybe the reason why they spend like billions of dollars of research is, um, is the answer. There is no location. It's like a way of being different in the world that we should, acknowledge and respect and like you know actually learn about and they should teach us yeah I, while you're saying that i think what i you know it's it was this move from recognizing the problem of essentialism and taking an anti-essentialist approach to then realizing what is essentialism getting at and it's getting at ability it's getting at modes of being in the world if you want to use you know the existential kind of framework mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that yeah all of that ties right back into what you're saying about aesthetics which ties into you know this whole conversation we're having about pedagogy yeah um uh i didn't get the chance to read what you sent me about the party um and you know, some of this thinking for me has tied into like, what is, what is the role of a vanguard? What is the role of a party? Does it have something to do with education? And does it, is it, you know, some, not you, as far as I've seen, but some people consider the vanguard to be, you know, the intellectual leaders of, uh, you know, either organic intellectuals coming out of the working class or, you know, petty bourgeois sympathizers, you know, these kind of, I think, older ideas of a vanguard. What, I mean, how do you relate these, these things? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I find there's one, there's one line that I, or there's a couple of lines that I play out that I like draw upon with in Lenin, where he's like in the party, all distinctions between intellectuals and like other people are obliterated, right? Like we're all intellectuals. That's like, you know, like they're like those, you know, Marx and Engels said the same thing. They were like, those who talk down to workers, you know, or maybe this was Lenin, but like those who, yeah, this was Lenin, like those who talk down to workers, like you, you're belittling our, our people and their, your belief in their capacity, you know, like that's what economism was doing. You know, that was his argument against economism, right? So it was really like the party is an egalitarian sort of thing that, you know, doesn't appoint itself. You, you don't say you're at the vanguard, right? Like that's not, you don't, you know, like that's not how that works, right? It's like based on people's experiences with you and your organization and, you know, your internal, like, the way that you function, right? And if like been there, or, you know, discipline and sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera, there you're like recognized. Your leadership is recognized, basically, whether it's Vanguard or not, right? Leadership right. is recognized. You can't just be like, I'm a leader, right? Um, because I have a leadership degree. Um, and so I think that I'm cutting out, so I'm just pausing. Oh, okay. Yeah, but so I think that the role of the party is educational in the sense that it has to balance learning and studying, right? And that learning is, uh, you know, this process that like, like think about organized protests, you know, like there's gotta be organized protests where they're like, you know, you get permits and whatnot, right? That's how people like can enter, like, you know, the, the you know, but there's also has to be moments of studying where we break those barriers, right? And, you know, like we, we push the limits, right? And then, you know, like, but how do we, we have to collectively determine, you know, when, like how to balance that and how to guide that, right? Because we have to hold both of those things in tension in the revolutionary process, you know, like it's important to learn. It's important to, you know, study, right? Like, but you can't just study forever or else you'll like die because you also, you know, like have like obligations, you know, or your family will die because you're not, you know, like working, right? Like, or you're not taking care of them. Um, so I, that's what I think that the role of the party is educationally. Like it's a, it was a pedagogical role that the party is supposed to play or the leadership or whatever, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the communist party, right? There's a revolution. Right. There's, there's an educational function of collective leadership. Right. I mean, we could, we could call it party, but we could also call it organization. Just like, yeah. you know, for people who, the anarchists who are watching this, obviously like, you know, we could be talking about black rose federation uh, just as much as like, you know, any, in this sense, uh, you know, a communist party, except the difference is obviously whether or not to participate in elections or whatever. Yeah. Which yeah. is a totally different question. Yeah. But, and of course, there, like the idea, you know, that you're talking about is like, you know, unfortunately there's many parties that are examples of that. Like here's what you, here's the truth, you know? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, you know, our electoral system, you know, obviously is going to favor uh, any kind of organization that structures itself to, you know, put its like popular, <clears throat> you know, it's celebrity in, on the front, right? It needs a face. It needs a celebrity. It needs, you know, whatever on local <laughs> politics, it needs to come from like the suburbs or whatever. It can't come from, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, about the United States, right? It's like, we don't have a representation, like it's not like proportional representation, right. right? Where you get 10% of the vote, you get 10% of the seats, right? It's like winner takes all. And that's yes. like what makes it so different from like other contexts. Right. It's not parliamentary. It's not, yeah. It's you, you, you're not forming coalitions among like, you, you know, uh, a shared strategy for the time or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> and then, you know, there's just the pure economics of like municipal politics where, you know, I mean, you could try uh, to get a popular person. Like I know people where I live have like just because they're well known have tried to run for office. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it really doesn't have to do with how much of a socialite you are or whatever. It has yeah. to do with, you know, uh, reaching people who are basically atomized and people who are living in their, uh, you know, I live in a college town, which <clears throat> has its own sort of political contradictions. So here it's about reaching the people that live 
in the suburban part, not reaching the people who live near the college, not the transient population, you know, mm -hmm. the people invested through home ownership and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. And but I will say that that also goes through like a point about be experiencing things ourselves because, you know, like it's one thing to be like the democratic party is a dead end. The democratic party is a dead end. It's another people. It's another thing to like go through that experience of, with people of like Bernie Sanders, you know, and like, and then like, oh, you know, like instead of being like, you know, like you're wrong for you know, hoping for him or whatever, like that's where people are at. Like, okay, let's go through it with them and see what happens, you know? And then yeah. a lot of people learned quite a lot, you know, to Bernie, what they did to him. And, you know, for me, it's about, it's all attack. The, the, there's no, you know, permanent answers to anything. Like there's no permanent right strategy or tactic. Uh, in Indianapolis, we recently had a DSA member, uh, Jesse Brown, who's like, you know, like very close with my organization, um, just has a different approach, but he won a city county council seat, which I was like amazed because he unseated like the second highest VP in the, like the high, second highest person in the local democratic party, Zach Adamson, who's like, you know, the first gay counselor or whatever. And, you know, like had been a council forever and it was amazing, you know? Um, but of course now, like they're going after him, you know, and they're like, why, you know, like it, it but he's, you know, trying to use the platform to at least like let us introduce bills so they can be debated and people can hear about them. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, right. I mean, the, the goal is, uh, you know, outside of that anyway, it's, you know, strengthening the organization itself in spite of whether or not, you know, the, uh, city council has so many people from that organization in it or whatever, because at the end of the day, like if we're trying to take over or become the producers ourselves, you know, this, uh, you know, be, uh, it's not necessarily a tax question, right? It can be, but it's a question of, uh, how we organize as proletarians and how we relate to each other and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah. And then nobody's got all the answers. And that's my thing. It's like, we got to, that's why the collective is not just the party. It's how the party relates to the, you know, the black, you know, federal, like the anarchist black cross, right. Or all these different groupings, like yep. the United front. I mean, that's it. We want to win. I don't care how we get there. Like I, I want to stop protesting. Honestly, like I don't like protesting. I don't like, or, like I want to live in a world where I don't have to protest all the time, you know? And um, if this if this group's going to do it, they're going to kick it off. Excellent, you know. If this strategy is, you know, it, do it, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, at this point, I think it's like it's interesting. We're at a time now where the protest is inevitable, whereas twenty years ago the protest was an uh, almost unheard of. You know, to go to a protest period was radical. Yeah, like you were doing something crazy to even be at a protest. Yeah, and now it's like. It's just part of the news cycle. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the like thing. People have experienced that. And like, how do we build on that? You know? Um, so, I mean, we talked about a ton of stuff here. Uh, I, you know, we covered you know, half the humanities, I guess. Uh, is there anything else you want to add? Anything you're working on? Um, no, I mean, not really. I, am I, I'm working on, um, uh, the, yeah, this campaign of free Shaka Shakur is a new African political prisoner from Indiana, currently held in Virginia, um, with through the Liberation Center. Uh, they're a member of the, of the center. Um, and that's like a new sort of area of work. And I've just been learning so much about it um, and developing a comradeship with, you know, Shaka and all the people who, you know, various tendencies have been, uh, you know, not nationwide organizing for him, but his freedom, but also the freedom of all political prisoners. Um, that's really what I'm focusing on now and not, um, you know, I write because I think that's how I think, you know, so I still write, but, um, you know, that's, but it's like, what sub um, subjected to the organizing. What, yeah. What is your main venue that you put your writings? Is it your, uh, do you have your own personal space or are you usually putting it in like different forum? 
Yeah, I try to write. Well, I, the books I publish have been with Iskra Press because I, you know, like their model and they're like, they're, they're, they've been great to work with. Um, but yeah, just different like popular blogs or whatever. I don't have my own website. Um, like, yeah. Um, but yeah, just basically like the Hampton Institute, you know, a monthly review or um, whoever will take it, you know, Black Agenda Report, depending on the topic. Cool. All right. Well, I, this is an awesome conversation. I really appreciate having you come on and talk about all these things. Um, I'm going to be touching on a lot of this stuff going forward. If I could find other people who are interested in it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah you definitely opened up the door for this. Cool. Thank you. I mean, I've, 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 it's been really helpful uh, thinking about this stuff with you. And so thank you for the questions that are thoughtful and um, yeah given me a new perspective on it also. All right. Well, I'll definitely have links to uh, all the things you mentioned and anything else you want to send me. And uh, yeah, I'm going to end the recording. All right, cool. Thanks.